Man, looking at that up here, it looks like a title of a lecture, doesn't it? It's probably not um, very enticing for you all. <laughs> well, we're going to be talking about the gospel and culture and subsequently the pursuit of happiness, possibly. So this morning, oh, it's so much warmer up here with these lights. Man, I was freezing down there before. It's really good. Thank you, lights. Um, so this morning, we're going to be asking ourselves this question. What drives you? And you can all ask, what drives me? What drives us? What's the thing that underpins the way that we live our life? I believe this is a very important question, not only to ask once, but continually ask if we are going to pursue a life with Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ, uh, man, I'll get my words out this morning at some point. Some people I've had conversations with in the past and the idea of asking um, yourself, why do I do what I do, can seem tedious, boring, and some people say, well, you know, I don't really need to ask myself that at all. I disagree. I think without asking ourselves questions like these. Why do I do what I do? Why? Asking ourselves the why questions, as I said in my last message as well uh, that I shared, it lacks direction. You don't really know what, how you're going about things. So, and it's important. And it's important for other reasons too, um, because I've been looking at these three things recently, and I've just put uh, brief, sort of simple definitions up there of what they are. So I've been looking at sociology, phenomenology, and a bit of a study of worldview. And there's two things that come out there and really make me sort of think, okay, asking myself the question, why do I believe what I believe? Why do I do what I do? Very important. And there's these two things. So in sociology, we have this concept. I'll try and um, explain it as best I can. If you're not understanding, just yell at me and we'll try and make it better. So in sociology, we have this idea that in any social structure, which is basically wherever there's people together, there exist conscious teachings, which are the ones that are talked about and expressed, and there's also unconscious teachings and unconscious belief. So there's basically teachings that exist that aren't actually taught, if that makes, if that makes sense. They exist as a, something that comes in and still affects the way that we live our lives, but we may not necessarily know it unless we explore it. And there's an idea in worldview as well. No worldview is incomplete. Sorry. No worldview is incomplete. But we have the power to change our worldview and hold our worldview and take ownership of our worldview. But if we don't do this, if we leave gaps in it that we don't explore and we don't really go, okay, I really believe this or I don't or whatever, then the prevailing ideology of society comes in and fills those gaps automatically. That's what we find when we study worldviews. No worldview is incomplete, but if we don't complete it, society does it for us. Are we on the same page? Is this making sense? Yes, good, good. So obviously this was very, very intriguing for me to, to look at because I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm probably doing things and reasoning things and things are affecting the way that I make decisions and that sort of thing without even knowing what they are because I haven't really explored them myself. So it made me reflect on my own. And then as someone who kind of is really passionate about just trying to figure out um, what living a life of faith means, what having a relationship with Jesus Christ means and trying to traverse that, church came up. And as we know, church, well, church really is just another social structure. It's a place where people come together, and it's more specific social structure, um, an institution, which you can do. There's a lot of stuff on institutionalization in sociology. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. But in, within church, we have conscious teachings that are expressed by institution and then reflected by pastors, uh, elders, fellow believers, and that sort of thing. They're not the teachings that I'm interested in looking at today. It's more the teachings that aren't taught, the unconscious ones that may have come in without us really noticing or really thinking about it. 
So we need to ask this question. In order to traverse and investigate those teachings, we need to ask ourselves this question. What drives you? And in light of, well, I'll just say this beforehand, because what drives us and what underpins the way we live our lives will actually affect our desires and our decision making and all of that sort of thing. There's actually a really interesting uh, concept in sociology. It's called the um, social construction of reality. So even our desires, something like our desires that we might think, wow, these are really personal, you know, they're mine, I'll claim them, actually says that to a certain extent they're socially constructed, which is very interesting. So we need to look at culture, and we looked at this as well. So looking at worldview, society fills the gaps that we don't. And so we need to answer the question according to society. What does, how does society answer the question, what drives you? What drives society? What underpins what drives society? Particularly looking at the context of a relationship. Because what's at the heart of Christianity? A relationship with Jesus Christ. So if we are not taking complete ownership of our worldview and society is filling those gaps, we need to look at what it's actually doing, what it's, what's actually driving society. And so in my reflections on society and culture and its sort of consumerist uh, capitalist ideology, I believe society's answer to the question, what drives you, is happiness. And we think about this in the context of a relationship. If you're both happy, and if, if we take the idea that happiness is underpinning a relationship and consequently is the ultimate goal of a relationship, if you're both happy, everything's fine. The relationship's going really, really well, you know? And there's that first, like, six months, what a lot of people call the honeymoon period, where you're both happy and everything's fine. And then after that, it's like, what if someone's not happy? If the thing that is underpinning and is the ultimate goal of the relationship isn't met, one of you's unhappy for some reason, what do you start doing? You start questioning. It's like, have I done something wrong? Is, did, did we rush into it too fast? And are you even the right person for me? You start questioning the relationship. Because the thing that's underpinning it is not being achieved. The ultimate goal is not being achieved. So there must be something wrong with the relationship. So according to society, in my reflections, the pursuit of happiness is what society is teaching us or what society, society's teaching is. And so now we ask ourselves about the gospel, because that's where we sit as a church. You know, we base our things on the gospel. And I would assert this morning that the gospel, in the context of relationship, particularly with Jesus, it has not been, it is not, and it will never be underpinned by happiness. The ultimate goal of a relationship with Jesus Christ is not happiness itself. Let's have a look at this. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And what's a cross? A cross, well, that's a torture device, basically. Um, we get the word excruciating from the word crucifixion. So it's something that reminds you of death and pain. And Jesus says, Take up that and follow me, and go where I went. And where did he go? He died. That's not too happy, in my opinion. It doesn't sound like happiness is the ultimate goal in that one. And the next verse we're looking at, Matthew 10, 38 and 39, is very similar. And he who does not take his cross, again, this torture device, reminder of death, and follow after me is not worthy of me. So a relationship with God doesn't sound like it's too happy. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Sounds like we have to give up a lot of stuff to follow him and be with him, in relationship with him. And Matthew 13, 44 to 46. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Now, it says joy there. I would assert that joy and happiness are two completely different things. Um, there's a famous writer who said, uh, he described joy as this, he said, in the midst of winter I found within me an invincible summer. See, that's joy, but happiness is this feeling. It's, it's, it, the definition of it is like uh, showing contentment or pleasure. 
It's a bit different to this. And Jesus is saying again, you have to give up things to follow him. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. He sold everything. And in the first part of the paragraph there as well, sells all that he had, selling everything again. Selling everything to follow someone or to be in a relationship with someone. Doesn't sound particularly like happiness is what is actually underpinning everything and the ultimate goal. It may be a byproduct, you could argue, but it's not what's underpinning the relationship. So in all these three instances, Jesus is telling us that you've got a choice, basically. You've got, you've got me, you can be with me, or you can just follow what society says that you should follow after. You can make me what is underpinning the way you live your life, and particularly the context of relationships, or you can make it about what society is telling you to make it about, which is what we looked at before, I believe, is happiness. From the, based on the evidence that I've been looking at. So in these situations, Christ himself is what is underpinning the relationship, the driving force. Christ is what's driving the relationship. And so now, in the light of what we were talking about before, about unconscious teachings and filling in society filling in the gaps of a worldview, we need to ask ourselves the question again, what drives you? What drives us? What is underpinning the way that we live our lives? What's underpinning our relationships? And then with the idea of unconscious teaching and society having this innate ability to just fill in the gaps for us, is it possible to think that Christ is the driving force behind the way we live our lives when he's actually not? Is it possible to think something is the way it is but it not actually be the truth? Is there something else that's driving us? So, Jimmy was waiting in line to be judged at the end of time. And the line's pretty long because, you know, there's a lot of people to get through, a lot of people to be judged. And uh, he's, he finds himself there and he goes, oh boy, wow, I didn't, you know can't believe I'm really here, it's going to happen. Then he starts thinking to himself, you know, reflecting back on his life and going, oh, I wonder, I wonder if I'll, you know, get into heaven. How, how did I live my life? What did I, you know, I did some pretty good things, did some bad things. Oh, no, but hang on, grace. No, God's grace will be enough, surely. Oh, but what if it's not? You know, he's asking himself these questions and he's sort of, you know, he's getting closer to the front of the line and as he gets closer to the front of the line, he sees some people going up from the judgment seat going up to heaven and some people going down to hell and he's, you know, starts sort of sinking in what's about to happen. He's like, oh my goodness, this is my fate that's about to happen. And he, he, just this anxiety keeps building up inside him and then he gets closer to the front of the line. He's like, oh my goodness, I hope, I hope Jesus Christ saves me. And then he gets to the front of the line and all his anxiety disappears and is replaced with complete befuddlement and confusion. Because he looks at the judgment seat and he sees Satan sitting there. And he's thinking, hang on a minute, what the heck? This isn't what's supposed to happen. And he's just in a bit of shock. And before he can, before he can start actually thinking through that, Satan begins to talk to him. He's like, ah, oh, Jimmy, welcome to judgment. I want you to take a look behind me, Jimmy. Look up there. That's heaven up there. There's no more pain. No more sorrow, no more tears, no more crying, no more anguish, no suffering. All you have to do to get there is bow down to me. And Jimmy's thinking to himself, what the heck? What's going on here? And then it hits him. And he says to Satan, where's Jesus? And Satan laughs and he goes, <laughs> Jesus? He's down in hell. Oh, and this is my version of hell, by the way, the ever-burning one. Forever. And all of a sudden, Jimmy realizes that he's left with a choice. He can bow down to the devil and go up to heaven. 
or he can follow Jesus to the depths of hell. What drives you? What is driving the relationship that you have with Christ? What drives you to come to church? Is it, is it something other than Jesus? Is it heaven? Is it a heightened sense of morality? Is it knowing the truth? Is it meaning? Is it purpose? Is it, is it something else that's not here? If we come to Christ, if we come to a relationship with Christ for any other reason than Christ himself and just being with him, because we'll get things. Is, is that not like going into a relationship with an agenda? It'd be kind of like going on a date and after finding out you know, about the person, it's like, okay, well, yeah, I'm happy to proceed because I'll get X, Y, and Z out of the relationship. Is that okay? These are just questions. Philippians 3 Verse 8 and 9, Paul says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. To be found in Christ, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Now what was underpinning the relationship that Paul had with Christ. Was it not Christ himself? Was Christ himself not the reason just to be with Christ, to be found in him? Is that not the reason Paul said these words? He must have had some crazy love for God that seems very different to a large extent, about what we can believe and what society tells us. And the relationship seems to be underpinned more by companionship than anything else, a love that is based more on companionship than a feeling or an emotion. That I may gain Christ and be found in him. So we need to ask ourselves the question, well that's just another question that's up there. Have we taken ownership of our worldview? Are there unconscious teachings within our own lives and within our own social structures? It doesn't necessarily have to be church. But you can ask yourself the question about church too. Are there things that have come into church and come into our psyche without us really knowing that alter what drives our life and what underpins our relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. The good news is that Christ and his love has the ability to permeate all aspects of our lives, every aspect of our lives, unconscious and conscious. He can be the very thing that is the driving force behind our lives and it can affect Everything, it can affect our desire, our decision making, our everything, the way we go about life. But the love that we're talking about here, it's, it's not that get a warm fuzzy feeling inside kind of love. It's not you make me happy kind of love. It's the self-sacrificial, altruistic, make it about someone else, gritty, agape kind of love. And I've heard it described as creating space within yourself for someone else to exist in. It's a love that seems based so much more on companionship than on a feeling or an emotion. What really drives you? Is there some other reason that you come to Jesus other than Jesus himself? What really drives you? There's another story. And Frank, 
He's in heaven. It's a different kind of heaven this time. The regular heaven. And he's made it inside. And Peter's let him in because Peter was there at the gate, St. Peter, with his guest list and looking, flicking through. He's like, oh, yep, you're in. Come on. And so he's made it inside. And he's looking at, at the people who've been, who Peter's turned away and who are just sitting there outside the gates of heaven. And he's thinking to himself, oh, wow, that's, they didn't make it in. And so he goes over to Peter and says, you know, Peter, what, what, why can't they come in? And he's just, Peter says, you know, I'm just kind of doing my job. I've got my list and, you know, they, they weren't on the list so they can't come in. And Frank, he looks at Peter and he says, you know, Peter, I think I'm going to stay outside with these guys. And Peter looks at him with a smile and he puts his hand on his shoulder and he says, finally, somebody gets it. Let's pray. Lord, you're just an incredible, incredible God. You offer us life to the full. And Lord, you offer us companionship forever. In Matthew twenty eight twenty you said, Surely I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. You promise to be with us. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you so much. Lord, I pray that everyone who's heard this this morning will just reflect on their own life. Not with fear, Lord, but in the hope that they would get to know you more. And as we go back into our weeks and we go from this place of meeting, Lord, there's people suffering all over the place. It's everywhere. It's rampant. I heard this morning Tisha's mother is in hospital. I just pray that you would be with her. Be a companion. Be with her through the pain. And Lord, that is just one instance that we know of. Lord, there are people here this morning who are hurting. There are people in our communities who are hurting, who are suffering. May we reach out to them and not turn a blind eye when they reach out to us. Give us the courage to be open, the courage to be honest, the courage to practice this self-sacrificial love that you have shown us in the life of Christ. May we make being with you the reason that we come to you for nothing else. I pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.